good team of people from Lewis, and uh, she's joining us, Diane Linney, and she's joining us this afternoon to explain her uh, experiment module here, and the title is Manufacture and Utilization of Mar Mars in situ propellants, and we're going all the way to NASA Lewis, as you know, they're combusting. We're going forward. Mr. Zubrin's got ideas, and Diane has ideas. And uh, we had him teamed up, but he couldn't come in today, so you're not, isn't that lucky, huh? All right, well, what a team that'd be. So we're very privileged to have her along with the other team from NASA Lewis, and she's going to give us a, a little information here. She said that uh, she's in the propulsion tech division of NASA Lewis, graduate in aerospace engineering, University of Michigan, master's degree from Case. Uh, at NASA, she works on combustion, heat fusion, fuels, technology, the last six years, she's been working on the production and propulsion of this project, and it's our privilege to introduce Diane. Diane, here she's speaking. Thank you. I asked to uh, pull the mic off from the podium so that I can uh, roam. I, I am always do a lot better when I'm allowed to roam. Um, if I if I start lagging down with the mic, though, let me know if you have trouble hearing me. Um, Okay, I will be talking about the manufacture and utilization of Mars propellants. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'm not going to get to the production plant right away because right now it's still heating up and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, first I'm going to talk about exactly what in situ propellant utilization means and why we want to do it. Um, the potential benefits, then, I'll, then we'll talk about the uh, demonstration, and then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, of the propulsion technology that I've also been working on. <laughs> Basically, using the in-situ propellants uh, provides unlimited range when you're exploring space. Um, and this is why this is this was done up by JPL quite a few years ago, and I always like to start out the talks with this because it kind of says it all. <laughs> um, what in situ propellant production is is the utilization of propellants produced from materials that are already there, and some of those materials um, we've also looked at doing this on the moon. On the moon, you, you can produce oxygen, and maybe for fuel, you can use some of the metals in the soil. Um, on Mars, Mars is a little better because, or a little easier, because it has a, an atmosphere, even though it's thin. It's about one hundredth of the uh, atmospheric pressure here on Earth, but it's still there, and it's very useful, and it it's, uh, consists of carbon dioxide. So we can, we can break that into oxygen for your uh, oxidizer and carbon monoxide, which is what I will be talking mostly about, or a second option for fuel is methane. Um, we're not sure how much hydrogen is available on Mars, so you might have to bring your hydrogen with you to do methane, and that is what uh, Bob Zubrin would be talking about, I believe, on Saturday. Just to show you what's available on the moon um, and, and why the moon is going to be a bigger challenge than Mars is that uh, basically this is just a little color drawing you have you have uh, you know everything together in minerals and they're in different uh, they're in different groupings and you find different uh, some minerals in one area and others in, in, in other areas um, oxygen is pretty prevalent though you can see the uh, the blue here so pretty much whichever mineral you choose you're going to get some oxygen out of uh, we have looked in the past at using some iron um, but iron turns out to be such a lousy rocket performer that you probably couldn't get off the surface of the moon with it. Um, unfortunately, the minerals that have iron in them are the easiest ones to break down to get your oxygen from. And it's kind of the same reason why it's a poor rocket propellant. It's just a, it's a, it's a weaker bond. Uh, so there's a bit of a conflict there. Metals on the moon are probably really far off, to be honest. But this is what you would go at. We've also looked at, uh, and, and I didn't have the opportunity to hear specifically what Brian spoke about, but I'm sure he mentioned aluminum in there somewhere. And we have looked at using the aluminum, you can see it up here in the anorthite. Um, instead of using aluminum in another liquid fuel, we've played around with putting aluminum right in liquid oxygen and, and uh, forming a monopropellant. So that's what we might do on the moon someday if we put a permanent base there. 
like we said, the, the metal fuel technology is, is probably a little bit farther off than what we have on Mars. To expand on that uh, cartoon a little bit that we showed in the beginning, um, the benefits you get from in situ propellants, there's, there's quite a few of them. First of all, you greatly, greatly, significantly, hugely can reduce the amount of mass you have to lift from Earth. And in this day and age, the amount of mass you lift from Earth is one of the biggest costs of, of going out into space. Um, there's two reasons why you reduce that. First of all, you don't have to bring your, your return propellants with you. Um, in most cases, the production plant will be much lighter than the return propellants that it will produce. And in the case of a permanent long-term habitation, you would only have to bring your production plant out once. So even if it was heavier, you still get a benefit in the long run. Um, but the other key that a lot of people miss is that you also don't have to lift the propellants to push those propellants out there because, uh, you know, which is also a large mass. Uh, your, your initial craft is lighter, so you don't need as much propellants to get there in the first place either. Um, the other thing you could do, or actually this is kind of an option, is you can uh, increase your payload capacity. If you do, if you can afford to lift a certain mass and send it to Mars, instead of sending a bunch of return propellants, you could send uh, a different payload. Um, you can also possibly reduce your mix mission complexity. Um, first of all, you've got refueling on the surface instead of potential refueling in orbit, which, uh, so now you have at least some gravity to work with instead of having to be floating up in orbit and do, you know, zero G pumping. Um, it can also potentially enable direct return missions, which, uh, especially on uh, Mars, if you would it launch and return directly to Earth instead of trying to launch and rendezvous with a return vehicle in orbit. Um, your, your mass reduction is so great that you can actually return directly to Earth. And finally, just as, a, as an added benefit, you, you kind of start to establish the self-sufficiency of your base, which again, if we want to, event, if we want to go permanently you know, out into space, you're going to want to do that eventually. Show you just a few examples of what, some, what we mean when we we have some of these benefits. This was a study we did. It was a JPL, uh, the baseline down here was a, a JPL study looking at a Mars sample return. They were going to return five kilograms from the surface of Mars back, back to the Earth. And we took their exact scenario and without really optimizing it for either of our propellant combinations, took a look at what would happen if we made our oxygen and fuel on Mars and you can see this would be the reduction in your launch mass if uh, the blue one if you use methane and oxygen and up here the red one if you use carbon monoxide and oxygen. Um, now the, this, this total reduction is about, I think it comes out to about 15% because you'll notice this isn't zero here. Um, but if we were able to optimize the mission and baseline in in situ propellants, the, the reductions are closer to 50 or 60% in Earth launch mass. This is another uh, chart that I actually borrowed from Johnson and JPL. Um, and this is an analogy of the early American pioneers. It's called the hay burner analogy. And they basically took a look at how much a mule, a six mule team can pull a day. And they, fill, they, it's, they said it can pull a, a light wagon, a 2,000 pound leg wagon, 25 miles per day. And so they loaded up this wagon with the oxygen, hay, and water that a mule needs to survive. And uh, they figured they, they know how much a mule you know, eats and drinks and breathes per day. So each mule needs 85 pounds of supplies a day to uh, survive when it's pulling this wagon. So you have a 2,000 pound wagon, 25 miles a day. You've got six mules that each eat 85 pounds per day and you've got about a 100 mile range. So what this means is that if the early American pioneers explored this country like we have been exploring space, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> because we never would have gotten farther than the, uh, get out of me, we never would have gotten farther than the Appalachian Mountains. So this is just, you know, but obviously we all know the mules ate and drank along the way. And, uh, and that's what we need to do out in space. <laughs> now, 
Now, what we have? Um, I'm still waiting for that to heat up, but let me talk a little bit about how this production plant works and, and what I'm going to show you today. Um, this is a, a prototype of a Mars propellant production plant and a, and a small demonstration engine. For those of you who haven't picked it off yet, the engine is this little tiny thing right here. It's very small. Very small engine. Small thrust. Don't expect smoke and flames. Don't worry about the smoke detectors going off. It's not going to happen. What this plant does is it, when I turn it on, right now I'm just heating it up a little bit, um, but it takes a simulated Martian atmosphere, which is a bottle of carbon dioxide over there, and uh, it breaks that into oxygen and carbon monoxide. Um, what we're doing right now is that top step, we are preheating some electrochemical cells, and I'll show you in the next couple of, of charts how those work, to about 800 degrees Celsius. Um, which is the red temperature that we see, those of you who can see it, is what we're reading right here. We're at about 741 degrees now. I can turn it on at about 760 degrees while it continues to warm up to 800, but we try and keep it around 800 for uh, maximum efficiency without melting our electrodes on either side of our, our cell. Um, in a few minutes, I'll turn on the supply of the simulated Martian atmosphere. Um, when cute little story about this. I took this out to a conference in Monterey and I ordered a bottle of carbon dioxide and uh, it didn't show up. And uh, so on the day of the presentation, or actually the night before, I went up to the bar and asked them if I could borrow one of their bottles that they use to uh, power their soft drink machines. So in the true spirit of in situ uh, propellant production, <laughs> I, I used what I could find at the site to complete my demonstration. Um, this one I brought with me, since this was just across town, I brought my own with me. Um, after we turn on the uh, carbon dioxide, I will turn on a, a DC power supply and apply about 1.5 volts across my electrochemical cells. There's three ways that you will be able to observe the oxygen production. The, uh, since the oxygen is actually passes through the cell electrically, it actually causes a current as it passes through the cell. So the four meters up top that are probably very difficult to see in this lighting will be, other than for these people right here probably, will be reading a, a current. Um, for approximately every quarter amp of current on each of these meters, we are producing approximately one standard cubic centimeter of oxygen per minute, which is very slow. This is, uh, on a sample return mission, you have about 500 days to produce all the propellant you would need to come home and this is probably about a one-tenth scale of that. So we're, we're producing it slowly. That's one way you'll be able to see the uh, production. The second way, and this is going to be even harder to see for those of you not right up here, is my last flow meter has a small stainless steel floating ball that should rise a little bit. Um, and finally, the third way is that um, the bottom meter is reading my oxygen storage pressure. And so that should start to rise. It goes up when things are working well, it goes up maybe a pound, one PSI per minute. So again, that's going to raise kind of slowly. Um, the, the overall goal of this production plan is to build up about 185 to 100 PSI pounds of pressure in my tanks in about two hours. Now, obviously, since I haven't turned it on yet, we're not going to quite get there. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute and tell you what we are going to see. So those are the three ways you'll be able to see oxygen production. And let me show you some pictures here to make that production a little, to make the process a little more understandable. Um, when I said an electrochemical cell, what I am using, and there's some other options, but what I am using right now is a zirconia oxide electrolyte, and it has a, uh, I believe it's a silver electrode on the inside and the outside. Um, what happens is that the carbon dioxide comes in and we heat it up very hot and there is a thermal electrochemical reaction on the inside of a tube up here that causes the carbon dioxide to break into carbon monoxide and oxygen. Um, the oxygen then on the surface of the zirconia tube breaks into two oxygen, ion, or two oxygen atoms which pick up ions from the negative electrode on that side of the tube. 
there is then a positive electrode on the outside of the tube, and since these two O's are now negatively charged, they are electrically pulled through this tube. When they get to the uh, positive anode, uh, they give up their electrons and reform O2, and then they are stored in my tanks. And that is the, so the, the passage of the ion, the passage of the electrons that are carried by the oxygen is what you'd see on the ammeters. And, that, and that's why it's an electrical process. One of the neat things about this is that the separation of the oxygen is electrical and it's not porous. This is not a porous membrane. This is 99.99% non-permeable. So it is not based on pressure, but it's based on electricity. And this can actually pump, so to speak, up to very high downstream pressures. So you would probably not need an extra compressor on your oxygen side to store up tank pressure because this can, this can build up. Uh, the manufacturer told me that they've had 18,000 PSI on one side of their tubes with near atmospheric on the inside. Speaking of tubes, I have an example of what this looks like. This is what I talk about when I say I have a tube. So this section here is, is just a, cut, a cross section of this tube. I'll pass this around. This does not have the uh, anodes or cathodes on it. The manufacturer asked me not to pass those around at conferences because part of the process, if someone in the audience who knows what they're looking at would look at it, could get some information. And also the closed end of this is, uh, is cracked off. Normally there's a hole. It's open at one end and it would be sealed at the other end. But this is what I have in my plant. With, with you know some silver cathodes and anodes and just just so you have an idea of the size and everything. The way I put these tubes together, um, I have four of them in my production plant, and uh, in order to increase your production, you can just keep adding more tubes is one possibility. Um, this shows a cross section of two of them. They're they're in a in a furnace that's heating them up to 800 degrees. Are we at 800 degrees yet? We're at 800, 785. Let me turn this on before I before I finish uh, continue talking. Um, when I when I turn it on, there is a compressor pump on the carbon monoxide side, so it will get a little louder. Hopefully, the microphone will allow me to speak over that without any problem. Um, but basically, what I'm going to do here without my chair sheet. Um, is just open up the uh, open up the carbon dioxide bottle, and all we do is uh, we we put a pressure of about eight psig because this is just pressure fed through the system. So we just load this up to about eight psig. Someone was asking me out in the hallway whether you really need, you know, I mean that's an awful lot higher than the Mars atmosphere. You're going to have to compress an awful lot to get this started, but we just since this is pressure fed and our and our pressure out here is you know a certain pressure we have to raise it higher than that right now to feed it on the mars atmosphere you should only have to raise it higher than the mars atmospheric pressure to get it started um i have that started i also have a uh, programmable controller in here so in order to start this i should just need to push one button and open one more valve Uh, my first uh, flow meter, my first flow meter valve here, just has all, allows all the carbon dioxide to go through it. The other four, the other four, hold on, are the individual carbon. Uh, I said I had four tubes. The other four meters show the individual carbon dioxide flow rates, and right now I am setting them to about 50 standard cubic centimeters per minute. I think that's a little overkill. I haven't had a lot of time to do a lot of parametrics to see what the minimum is. I'm probably putting more CO2 through than my tubes can produce. But we should have seen, oops, if I turn my power supply on, I'm skipping my check sheet, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, if, I, if I put a 1.5 volt power supply over here, 
or 1.5 volts potential, these uh, ammeters have jumped up. Now those in the front row, they will die down when it first starts off. There's some ambient uh, extra oxygen that's been dissociated and lying around. So you see a really high current. They should level off between 0.5 and 0.7 uh, amps each. And my total current here will probably level off about 2.5 amps, hopefully. And hopefully as we go on, we'll start to see some pressure rises in these, on these two gauges. So what's going on right now is uh, one of those zirconia tubes, like the one going around, that has an electrode around it, we have a feed tube on the inside. And we bring the uh, carbon dioxide in, and it comes down the tube, and while it's coming down this tube, it gets heated to that 800 degrees. Um, when it comes out the open end, down here, it starts to flow back this way, and as it flows back, it partially gets dissociated into the, car into the oxygen and carbon monoxide, and the oxygen is passed through this tube. Um, the zirconia tubes are then sealed in another metal tube, and it comes out of the furnace at the other end, um, where it, they're all collected into my tanks. Um, this just shows an example of what the, uh, the wire here is, is depicting the negative and uh, negative charged wire on the inside of the tube. And there's also a similar one that would be on the outside and that's what pulls the oxygen through. So that's what uh, each four, all four of those is what we're seeing the uh, current draw on. How's it doing? Okay, we're steadying out a little. You'll notice then that coming out of here we'll have a uh, mixed gas stream of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide because we don't 100% dissociate our carbon dioxide. In fact, that's one of the t large technology issues of this technology right now is uh, we need to get higher dissociation rates of the carbon dioxide in order to make this uh, more efficient and less power hungry. But we take that stream and we pass it through a carbon monoxide separator system. Um, so we take the exhaust stream from the oxygen production and we flow it over an adsorbent material that preferentially adsorbs the carbon dioxide. So what we've got here on this top pressure gauge which is uh, starting to rise already, we're at about 5 psi. On this top pressure gauge, this is the pressure of the CO that has passed through the separator. The CO2 has been absorbed, and the CO is, is going on downstream in the system. Um, in this case, since we don't have a nifty system that uh, pressurizes for us, I have the compressor pump that pressurizes. What, what the, the way this would be set up then is you'd run, you'd have a couple separation beds and you would run through one until it has absorbed all the carbon dioxide it can, sort of like a sponge soaking up water pretty soon. It just can't soak up anymore and it starts dripping. Uh, when you're done with that, you would switch over to your other one. And the way you clean the carbon dioxide out is you pull it off with a vacuum. Now in my rig here on Earth, I've had to put a vacuum pump in my rig. But my vacuum pump only pulls down to a, about, uh, I think, a tenth of a PSI. <coughs> which is about one hundredth of an atmosphere, which happens to be what we naturally have on Mars. So on Mars, all you would have to do to clean out this system is open a valve to atmosphere, and it would pull all the CO2 back out into the atmosphere, and then you'd ha it'd be ready to absorb some more. Um, this is what it looks like, and I drew this vertically. At one point, I was trying to drive the scale. Okay, it fits. Um, and it's pretty simple. I just took a copper tube, filled it up with some commercially available absorbent material, and we just flow the stream through. Uh, by the time it gets down to here, it's pure carbon monoxide. And, and this material in here is soaking up the CO2. Uh, when I'm done, I switch it over to another one. I have a schematic here to try and show you the switching system. I didn't want to put up too many schematics, but this was hard to explain. Um, these are the two separators in my system. I'm just going to be running through one today because mine are sized to run for about an hour before the carbon dioxide breaks through. Um, but basically I would run uh, my pumps right here and I'd run through here. There's the gauge we're watching the rise and there's my storage tank. 
when, when I finish, and when that's saturated, I'd switch these two valves over. So now I would start running through here, and while I'm running through there, I turn on my vacuum pump, and I just start pulling a vacuum on that until it's cleaned out. Again, like as, as I said on Mars, um, you just have to open that valve to atmosphere. And we, we were at one point considering testing this in a vacuum chamber, so that's why I have a bypass around my pump. If we did ever test it in a vacuum chamber, I could, I could try that part of it. The capability of this particular pro production plant is about 15 standard cubic centimeters per minute, although I'm not going to be getting that. You, you can do the easy math by saying for every one total amp of current, which should be the red number up here, I'm at 3.3. For every one total amp, I'm getting about four standard cubic centimeters. So I'm at 3.3 right now, so I'm a little over, I'm about 13. Three times four is 12, yeah, I'm about 13. Um, so I'm not quite up to the 15 at the moment. Um, that's about 0.015 kilograms per half day. I'm trying to remember the mission profiles. I think, I think, I don't remember how much propellant we needed. But this is about a tenth scale of what you would need for a Mars sample return mission. Um, and the carbon monoxide, it basically produces it at a stoichiometric mixture ratio, which is kind of convenient because that's the mixture ratio we like to use it in an engine. Um, one of the issues with the methane alternative is that the production technology or the production process that they're using uh, produces it at a ratio of uh, oxygen to methane is 2 to 1, and you really like to run that in an engine of about 3.4 to 1. So you have to, produce, you have to produce more oxygen somehow to get your, get your propellants in the right ratios. Um, but this one is coming out just at what we want to, just at what we want to fire it at. The original purpose of this demonstration is not only to generate confidence among the mission planners that in situ technology works, but to also be able to do what I'm doing right here, carry it around a little bit and get, get people a little excited about it. Um, in order to prove, you know, I can, I can come here and point and say, oh, look at that, we're up to 10 pounds of carbon monoxide and uh, almost 20 pounds of oxygen, but you guys really don't know. <laughs> You're taking my word for it that I got 20 pounds and 10 pounds in there. Uh, and that's where the rocket engine comes in. Um, basically, I have two tanks here, and um, the original design is to be storing that gas in these tanks, and at the end of the presentation, which usually takes you know, an hour and a half, um, I would have about 100 pounds in here, 85 or 100, and I'd be able to pop my engine off. Um, unfortunately, Yesterday morning when I was running a final checkout on this uh, system, I found a leak in my pump. And um, that's going to kind of prevent me from, from storing all the fuel I would need. That's why I didn't start it early enough. So what I did, and I'll pop it off later, is I, I pre-filled these two tanks. Now again, you've got to take my word for it that, that the, gas is, uh, the gas is coming. But I'm going to show you what it would have sounded like if I didn't, if I didn't uh, burst a leak in my, in my pump. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the purpose of the engine on top, um, and it's a pretty simple system. It's, uh, it's just, it just uses a spark for ignition. Um, I do put a drop of water in the engine to act as a catalyst, and I have a little more, more to talk about why, why you need a catalyst for this and how that works. So you'll see, uh, I'll talk about that before I uh, turn it on. And um, it's about a tenth of a pound of thrust. A Mars sample return mission would need an engine of about 500 pounds of thrust, and it would probably use three of those. It would most likely use two on the first stage and one on the second stage. So this this is not intended to to you know demonstrate a real engine. It, it was just intended to uh, to pop off the propellants and show that you have made something combustible. This is just a, a simple little drawing of the engine. It just has a a very small throat in there and uh, a standard spark plug and it's just pressure fed which most likely is what we would do on Mars you don't want to have a lot of complicated turbo machinery um, the turbo machinery is what keeps the turnaround times on the space shuttle so high um, you know turbo machinery is fine if you're launching off the surface it gives you higher pressures it gives you higher performance but if you're coming back from Mars you're going to be sitting there for 500 days before you fire off your engine in dust storms and who knows what else 
you, you probably don't want to go with turbo machinery, so you'll probably just pressurize your tanks to about 500 pounds and, and let them just blow down. Jesus, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> okay, um, while we're letting that run a little bit more, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the propulsion experiments we've done. Carbon monoxide and oxygen has never been used before in a rocket engine. Uh, one of the reasons is it's not a really great performing engine in terms of a specific impulse. Or for those of you who aren't into rocket engines, it's kind of like a miles per gallon rating. Um, hydrogen and oxygen gives you the highest specific impulse, and that's why we use it on the space shuttle. Um, we used it on some of the stages on Apollo. Um, solid propellants give you a much lower specific impulse, but sometimes on first stage vehicles lifting off of Earth, you want to just dump a lot of mass fast to get the high thrust you need to lift off, so you're not as concerned. Carbon monoxide has a specific impulse of closer to the solid propellants, but the nice thing is that it's there, and, uh, and you don't have to, you know, you, you have to make more, so you might need to run your plan a little bit longer, but usually in Mars missions, because of the planet alignments, you've got a lot of time. The uh, experiments that we've done in trying to develop an engine is uh, we started out with some ignition characterization. Uh, we did some subscale engine performance to find out exactly what its performance is. And then we looked at the uh, heat transfer to see how we would have to cool it. Um, we have also designed and are currently having built a full scale engine, which is, uh, would be a 500 pound thrust engine with some uh, flight like materials. I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, one thing we found out on the ignition of this propellant combination is that it's very slow. Uh, the overall reaction is carbon monoxide plus one half O2 goes to CO2, and kinetically speaking, it is slow. Um, that slow reaction is one of the two reasons why you have a catalytic converter in your cars, and why you're no longer allowed to use leaded gas because leaded gas poisons catalytic converters. The solid catalyst in the catalytic converter uh, helps quicken that reaction along. Um, however, you can also use other catalysts, such as hydrogen, will also help quicken this reaction. And the part of the process that you go through is you uh, take that hydrogen and it reacts with the oxygen and it goes to OH, and that's very fast. And now you can, break up, you can react your CO a little, in a little better reaction. You take your CO and react it with the OH radicals, and that goes to CO2 which, with H, which is still slow, but not very slow. And then the hydrogen recombines back into a, a hydrogen molecule, and that's why we call it a catalyst. Um, what I've done in this engine is I just put one drop of water because uh, we have found that the water in the, in the, hy or the hydrogen in the water will also perform the same function. Little pictorial representation of, for those of you who, uh, who chemistry was way too long ago. Um, I got this out of my first term college chemistry book. And the reason this was in here was because it was talking about cars. Uh, but basically, this is how a sol solid catalyst works. And it's the same idea with the oxygen. It, it pulls on a CO molecule and an oxygen molecule. The, the active sites in the catalyst will break those up and then they break the oxygen up and the oxygen will go where the CO molecules are, where it then combines and, and desorbs off. That's, that's basically what's going on in your catalytic converter. And it, it's similar where uh, the, the function of these little active sites on the solid catalyst are being performed by the hydrogen in my system. So we, we performed a series of experimental tests and we just basically wanted to know, will this stuff light with standard rocket engine hardware? We had it in a spark torch igniter. Uh, it was the first time that this combination had been burned in rocket hardware. Carbon monoxide, by the way, is used very often in Bunsen burners in laboratories when they want a dry flame um, for, you know, to produce a dry flame. Um, so we defined the ignition boundaries and determined how much of that hydrogen is actually needed. This is... Uh, basically what the hardware looked like on the stand. There's no reference as to size, but this is about that long. Uh, so it's only a few inches long. This is called a spark torch igniter, and uh, 
It's basically what we use at Lewis to light all of our experimental hardware. It's very reliable. All you have is a spark down here, and you burn in here, and this is just an exhaust tube. The blue you he see here is just typical of a hot carbon dioxide flame. Uh, carbon dioxide is blue when it's hot. And what we found out was that we can light off carbon monoxide and oxygen in all sorts of conditions. Um, we vary the oxygen temperature a little bit because it will be coming in cold since we'll probably be storing it as a liquid. So we, uh, we vary that a little bit. Uh, that's shown in these different shaded areas. Here's your mixture ratio. That's the ratio of oxygen to carbon monoxide. Normally we'll be running way down here. So you can see down here that we needed very little hydrogen. This is less than 0.1 of 1% of the fuel needed to be hydrogen to get it started. Once you get it started, you can turn the hydrogen off and you don't need it anymore. That's why I was able to just put a drop in my engine and that should get it started. Since those were so successful, we went on to some engine tests where we uh, looked at a couple different types of injectors and wanted to measure the performance. This is what the engine looked like. Again, you have the blue carbon dioxide flame coming out, nice pretty shock diamonds. Um, this is about a 50 pounds of thrust. It's again just our, usually the size we use at Lewis for our, our first scale experiments when we're doing fuels testing. Um, and what we measured was something called the combustion chamber sea star efficiency, which is basically a measure of how good, how much, how much propellant that you put in did you actually combust. Um, you basically know if you put in a certain amount of propellant, it should produce a certain chamber pressure. And then you measure and you get chamber pressure a little bit lower because you didn't maybe burn all of it completely. And this is what we're measuring. And we found one of our experimental injectors up here, and uh, up here is a theory point because there are always going to be a, certain, a few losses that you're never going to be able to get around. So we felt pretty good about this. We were able to get our efficiencies, especially in the range that we're talking about firing, which is right about here. We can get them pretty close to uh, theoretical there. We also took a look at the um, heat transfer characteristics. Um, somehow you're going to need to cool this. The space shuttle main engines are cooled regeneratively, where the hydrogen, before it is sent into the engine, is flowed up and down through tubes um, around the ch uh, up and down the chamber and part of the nozzle, and it soaks up the heat, and then, you, and then it's already preheated and you send it into your engine. Um, we probably won't want to do that on Mars, because one of the things you need to do regenerative coolant is turbo machinery. And we, again, don't want to use turbo machinery if we don't have to. Um, but there are other methods. A lot of space engines use radiative cooling. Um, so what we would be looking for maybe is, is you know, a combination of some radiative cooling. But we needed to determine how hot the walls were getting in the first place. So the way we did that was uh, we, we had an uh, engine that at different locations along the engine, and the nozzle should look like this too. I just didn't have a schematic with my nozzle on it. Uh, we would run water. So basically we'd run water in here. It would split, run around the engine, and then come out. So at that particular location in the engine, we can measure how much heat the water picks up. And based on how much heat the water picks up, you know how much heat the, the propellant is giving off to the walls. Um, so we, we did some tests like this, both on the on the chamber and on the nozzle. These are always really fun tests for the uh, laboratory technicians to put together. <laughs> this is kind of what it looks like on the test stand all plumbed up. I had, uh, I don't remember, I had something like 30, I think, cha cool, uh, water channels. So these are the inlets and outlets of about 30 different channels. There's also a uh, thermocouple on the outlet of each water channel so you can measure the temperature of the thermocouple coming out. Um, up here you have uh, uh, your flow meters for each of the channels so you know exactly how much water is flowing through that channel at what rate. It's kind of a plumbing nightmare. This is the uh, right in here there's our nozzle exit. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is just a little close-up. That's what it looks like firing. The other reason you don't see the uh, nice blue flame on this one is uh, we were just too bright and the camera couldn't back down its iris fast enough on that picture. 
But what we found out, and this was kind of interesting, this is a bit of a, and this goes back to the same issue we had with uh, the slow kinetics of the reaction itself. We were able to find out that the reaction can keep going without hydrogen, but it's, it's probably still a little bit slower than, say, a hydrogen-oxygen reaction. And you can see that in the uh, temperature profile. This is the temperature or the heat going to the wall, and oxygen, hydrogen oxygen would come down almost straight down and level off. Um, then you come into your nozzle and you have a high peak at your throat because you're going very fast there. You have a lot of heat transfer at your throat. But carbon monoxide, you can see it comes down, but then it goes back up. And what we're surmising here is that we really haven't finished burning until about two and a half inches into our chamber, and that's probably due to the little slower kinetics. But all that means is we got to make our chamber about two inches longer. And that's, that's really, we don't consider that a big technology drawback or driver. Um, it's just something we needed to know so we can make sure we, uh, we burn fully. We have taken all of this information from our experiments and we have, along with some theoretical codes, and we have designed a uh, full-scale rocket engine. Um, there is a lot of different NASA centers that are working on in-situ propulsion technology, not just Lewis. Um, JPL and Johnson are also major players. Um, they work on the production plant technology uh, as well as the mission planning. Um, the, uh, there's a gentleman at JPL right now who is kind of leading some of this activity, and he talked to me and he said, you know what I'd really like to see is a full-scale engine with flight weight materials. I said, oh, is that all? <laughs> I suppose you want me to fire that with liquid oxygen and liquid CO also. No problem. Um, anyways, then I did some creative, uh, creative uh, contracting work, and we had a contract with a small business that we redirected a little bit. They're a materials expert, and they are currently building us a uh, lightweight, full well, it's a 500-pound thrust engine. Uh, the one I will test won't have a, a large nozzle on it because that would be overexpanded at atmosphere, but it would, uh, it's, it's designed to go up to a 200 to 1 nozzle expansion ratio. And the flight size engine for 500 pounds of thrust, they figure without the injector is going to weigh about 3 pounds. And the way they've done that, maybe a little bit more, 3, 3.5. Three and, um, and the way they're doing that is, is um, a lot of people have been playing with ceramic technologies, silicon carbides and, and, and variations on that, carbon-carbon uh, composites and variations on that. Um, those are very lightweight and they have a very high strength. Um, and they can take a certain high temperature. Um, other people for some space engines have been playing with iridium rhenium, which is a metal alloy, which can take a very hot temperature, 4,500 degrees maybe Fahrenheit at the wall. And that can take a very hot temperature. And um, this company, without getting into too many particulars at this time, um, is kind of combining those two technologies to give a very lightweight structure, but to give you the very high temperature liner on the inside. So I'm pretty excited about that. Hopefully. Uh, late this year or early next year, I'll be uh, firing that off if I convince somebody to give me the money to test it. I got the engine for free, now I gotta get the money to test it. Um, back to our production plan here. We have gotten up to about 34, 33 pounds on the carbon monoxide, um, but again, what I'm pressurizing, it probably wouldn't be that high if I had this valve open, um, because what I'm pressurizing is, is the separator and everything. Um, although the volume here is actually much smaller than my separator volume, so even if this valve had been open, it still would have been going up almost at that rate. Um, the oxygen, oh, we're cruising. The oxygen's up to about 45, uh, 45 psi. You can see this has dropped down to about where I said it would level off at. It's about 2.4 total amps. Um, if we kept going at that rate, um, and if I didn't have a leak in my pump, the leak's not too bad, I haven't set off my carbon monoxide detector yet. I do have one back there in case anybody's worried. Um, so you should hear that beep before anybody gets affected. By any of this. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're sitting really close, you're probably concerned about it when I keep saying I have a leak, right? <laughs> Don't worry, I've been working with this for a long time. I have no speech problems or anything. <laughs> uh, I've been working on this for three years. <laughs> no, no, I don't have enough gas in here to blow up this machine. <laughs> um, anyways, what uh, normally what I would do, you know, if we went, if we kept going at this rate for about another hour and a half, 
or so, I, I would have, and if I had these valves open, I'd have about 100 pounds in there. At that point, I'd shut this down, which I will do right now. It shuts everything off. I still have a low hum on my, uh, on my, uh, I have a fan going to cool, keep my uh, uh, flanges cool. Um, and when my flow rates drop, I will, I will shut my valve and turn off the current now, or turn off the power supply. You will see when I turn off the power supply that it will go to zero and then it will come back up. Um, I'm not an electrochemist, but it has been explained to me. I should mention, actually, because I know people in the audience will get mad at me if I don't. Um, originally, I started this project as a team with uh, the University of Arizona. They, they have a space engineering research center there that was, I, I guess still is, but at a much lower level, funded by NASA. Um, their their uh, charter was to work on production technology, and, and they, uh, they've done some great work. Originally, they shipped me, along with a student to run it, a uh, production plant with the zirconia technology that I described, a little different system on the carbon monoxide side. Um, over the three years since the student has come and gone, I've, uh, I've made a few modifications. The zirconia technology is pretty much the same. I, I've made some changes on the carbon monoxide separation. But um, they were the first ones that, that taught me how the zirconia technology works and everything. So if you have any more questions on what I'm about to say, find one of them in the audience. Um, but basically, when I do turn off the power here, I'll, I'll set it to zero, and you'll see it go back up. It has been explained to me that since there is oxygen now on the other side of the tube, it's actually going to start working like a battery and work in reverse. And the oxygen will actually pass back through the tube and create a voltage. So it's, what we're doing is very similar to battery technology. And that's all I'm going to say on that, because I'm not a battery technologist. Uh, so we're basically all shut down. I uh, turn on power to my engine system. It is power, the spark is powered by two 12 volt batteries um, inside here. I uh, open up two hand valves. I have two solenoid valves right here. These are the only things now keeping my oxygen from getting into my engine. Before my, there's not going to be a flame here. I'm just warning you. Okay. Uh, out in the hallway before my presentation, I, I put a drop of water in the chamber, as I mentioned. And so now if I hit this button right here, uh, the gases should be released. The spark is a continuous spark for about 2.5 seconds. So you will hear a bit of a beep because the spark's at a frequency, and that's the spark beep. Um, but you should hear a louder pop, and that's, that's the uh, propellant's combusting. I'm going to put the uh, microphone at the other end to make it sound more impressive. <laughs> Well, hey, look, at least I'm not lying about any of this, right? You can't say I'm hiding anything from you. So here it goes. Um, I'm going to warn you, I've been having a little bit of problems with my run button. So hopefully the spark will go out. All right, we'll try it again. Um, this engine was working great until it came time for presentation, and then... Uh, and then we suddenly had troubles. Okay, let me try one more time. <laughs> Hold on, let me try something. This shouldn't work, but it does. I've, I've, closed my, uh, I've closed my valves right in front of the solenoid valves, and what I have here is just a spark button, just so you can hear what the spark sounds like and to let me know that the spark still works. sparkler sounds like. For some reason when I open these valves it doesn't go off. You explained it to me, I don't know. And the elect <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> okay, let's try that one more time. I'm losing all my gas. <laughs> Actually, uh, I only get a flash.
play about, about, about one out of every hundred times I pop that off. So, yeah, good timing. It only took four tries for that to work. Just in case we're leaking, I'm going to put that up there. That's about it. Are there any questions? Um, the question was, how do you get the 800 degrees centigrade on Mars? And um, that opens up a whole discussion. Um, two, of the, two of the big technology issues right now of zirconia is the temperature you need and the dissociation efficiency. However, this production plan I've been working on it for about three years, and it's kind of obsolete already, at least the zirconia side. Um, there are two groups that have a lot of really neat ideas, and, and Arizona, University of Arizona is one of them. Um, the University of Old Dominion, Bob Ash is working on another one that, that is pretty excited. And one of the things they're really working on is getting that 800 degrees down to about four or 500, which is still hot, but it's a lot less power requirement. And, and that's what you're asking. What we're trying to do for a sample return mission is uh, solar power. Um, and, but you, know, you can use solar power on Mars, you, if you, but you've got to keep your power down, otherwise your solar panels will be very, very large. We are trying to get the power down low enough to, uh, to be able to do a reasonable solar, solar power. And like I said, the zirconia tubes I have in there at 800 degrees, we've we got to do something better on that. Um, but both of the groups that I mentioned are talking about getting that down at least 300 degrees and at the same time, hopefully, improving the dissociation efficiency. So you'd need fewer. Um, Dan Golden, who is the head of NASA, has told us, um, being the whole in-situ community who have been working on this for the last six or so years, that if we can get a sample return mission for about 300 mil 250 to $300 million, that he'll fund it. And that's what we're aiming for. We're not there yet because of some of the, um, mostly the power issue, both on my production, on the carbon monoxide technology and on the zirconia, or the Sabatier technology, that you would need for methane. Um, there, there's both a big power issue, and not only in the production, but I just made gases and stored gases. And for, in order to come back from Mars, even on a sample return, you're probably going to need to store them as liquids. So there's another step, and that takes power also, unless you can do something slick with that. And I think Bob Zubrin will also be talking about compressor compression uh, work um, on Saturday. Uh, no, okay, no, I would still store them as a liquid because I would need that extra density. If I stored them as a gas, they would just get too big of tanks, and then your tanks would start to get too heavy. So, yeah, it would be as a liquid, but you would still, you would just maybe autogenously pressurize or something, take some of the gas coming out and, and let it pressurize the fluid out. Uh, yeah, I, I, I probably didn't say that very clearly. So we are talking about storing them as a liquid eventually. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona, um, I just said that so everybody could come and ask you more, um, <laughs> asked me in my perspective what is the next step. And I was talking with a couple other gentlemen from Arizona. Um, Lewis Research Center um, and me personally never intended to do production plant technology. We do the propulsion work. Um, we liked this as a demonstration. Um, in my opinion, we need to work on the zirconia technology for those two items I mentioned. You've got to get your, your power down, which means your, your, your temperature. Um, you also need to get your dissociation efficiency up, which means how much CO2 do you dissociate. Um, and if you can get it high enough, you know, I've heard one group at Old Dominion you know, quote that they thought they could get it up to maybe 90%. If you get it that high, you know, you might not even worry about separating the carbon monoxide from the leftover CO2. You might just, you know, so you'll have a little bit of inert in there. We've done studies where it shows a little bit of inert doesn't matter. So in my opinion, we need somebody to work on those two items. Um, I think demonstrating a full-scale engine is going to convince people, both with methane and CO. Nobody's fired, you know, a full-size methane engine either. You know, a flight weight, radiative, 
heat transfer technology. So those are some of the things that need to be worked on. Um, well, that particular engine I would like to test at Lewis. The production plant technology I would like to see either Arizona continue it, so, you know, and if, if JPL wants to go to a contractor subletting to Arizona or to some, you know, one of the other universities that's done so much work in it, you know, that's, that's not my decision because JPL and Johnson are mostly leading the mission. Uh, Lewis is, is more a support on the propulsion technology. Yes, sir. How difficult is it to do the Sabatier uh, process to take down the methane? Uh, I'm not an expert on the Sabatier. The question was, how difficult is it to do the Sabatier process? Um, <clears throat> if I was Bob Zuber, and I would say, the Sabatier technology has been around since the 1800s. <laughs> it's off the shelf technology, and it's very easy. And a lot of what he says is very true. It is. Um, one of the problems with the Sabatier technology is you do need to bring hydrogen with you. So there's an issue of um, bringing hydrogen all the way to Mars and still having it there and not boiled off and vented off when you're there. Um, we have some cryogenics people at Lewis who say that's not a problem, and they feel they could bring it. Why can't you get it from water on Mars? Well, because we don't know if there is water on Mars. If it is, the amounts that we need would be in the permafrost, which, you know, if you remember in the beginning, I talked about how much more difficult it's going to be to get propellants on the moon because you have to mine and drill. So going into the permafrost is is uh, probably something that's going to be a, not as easy to do autonomously on a robotic mission. Um, also, I've heard people say that where there are higher concentrations of water, or potentially higher, con like let's say the, I the polar caps are water, um, that's not necessarily where we want to go. <coughs> so now you either have to go someplace you don't want to go, or you have to bring that back to where you want it to go. Um, but in the future, when we start sending people to Mars, that, that's probably what we're going to do. But if we do find water there and we find that much of it, why make methane? Why not just use hydrogen? We'll take one more question. Um, the question was, what are the advantages of the CO over the methane, aside from the fact that uh, the methane needs a, a hydrogen source? Um, one other, and I don't know if this is an advantage um, as much as something that's maybe not always factored into the methane analysis. I mentioned that methane, um, the reason why methane looks so much more attractive is it's a much better engine performer than carbon monoxide. Um, in, in relative terms, if the specific impulse of of carbon monoxide is 280 seconds, methane might be 340. Um, hydrogen and oxygen, which we talk about like in the space shuttle main engines, is up at 480. So you can see that methane still isn't you know, at, at the level of hydrogen and oxygen. But when you produce it using the Sabatier process and the water electrolyzer, um, you have a mixture ratio of only 2 to 1 instead of 3.4. And at 2 to 1, your, production, your, your ISP is not 345. It, it's much lower. So now you need to either run at a lower engine performance, which now you you get less of the engine benefits of the, than the CO, or you uh, you need to bring something else along, either bring more hydrogen along to make more oxygen and vent your excess methane, or bring a zirconia cell along to make some excess oxygen direct from the atmosphere to to be able to run your methane engine at its optimum. Um, I also feel, and, I, and this could be wrong because I, I haven't seen Bob's plant in person, I've just seen presentations on it, but if you can get the temperature down a little bit um, and the dissociation efficiency up, this is, this is a pretty simple system in terms of production wise, and, and my, my gut feeling is that this might just end up a little more reliable. All you're doing is blowing, blowing gases through, you're not forming water that you then have to electrolyze, um, you're, you're blowing gases through, I think you have fewer steps in this process, especially if you got your dissociation efficiency high enough that you don't have to worry about pulling off your leftover CO2, and you just got one step. Thank you, Diane.